we uh, we got it out of the different parts of the brain, so I'll talk about those now. This um, pink part here, that's big, it's got all these curves, it's called the cerebrum. And it comes in two halves, a right half and a left half. In general, the right half controls the left side of the body and the left half controls the right side of the body. And the cerebrum is where you do all your conscious, conscious thinking. Memory, thinking, it's all in the cerebrum. And they've kind of been able to map out what parts of the cerebrum do what, and I'll show you that in just a little bit. Your personality is here in the cerebrum. All your conscious control of your muscles, if I want to move my arm muscle, that starts in the cerebrum up here. The cerebrum is huge in humans, way bigger than it is in animals, other animals besides humans. Um, so that's kind of what makes us human, is our big cerebrum. It's got all these little folds and grooves. That's to give more surface area, because the surface of the cerebrum, it's called the cerebral cortex, and that's where all the cell bodies are. So the more surface you have, the more cell bodies you have. And that's why there's all these grooves and such. In simpler animals, there are no grooves. You take a reptile or something like that, its cerebrum is small and it doesn't have any grooves. It's just nice and smooth. So reptiles don't do much thinking. Memory, it's hard to teach a reptile tricks. They don't remember the trick. They just do their thing. Um, this part of the brain right here, is this because it matches the thing. This part right here is, there's two parts of it. This part up here is called the diencephalon, and this part down here is called the brain stem. If this were a brain flower, I'd be holding the brain stem. Okay. Like that? Now, this, so this part of the brain, it controls the diencephalon and the brainstem, control everything that is subconscious. Things like your digestion, your heart rate, your body temperature, hunger, thirst, control of your, all your organs in your body that squirt out hormones and things like that, your sex drive. Your emotions, like fear. You can't control fear. I mean, you see me, you're scared. You can't control that. That's all in here. And different parts do different things. This part here, the medulla oblongata, is involved in breathing and heart rate and control of your dilation and constriction of your blood vessels. And this part's called the pons. It's kind of a... a um, relay station. It sends some signals here to the cerebellum, some signals to the cerebrum. It kind of is a traffic controller. It also helps some in breathing. This part right here, the midbrain, is more traffic control. Some of the reflexes that are associated with hearing and seeing are associated in the midbrain. You have reflexes that never go from the eyes, that never go into the brain other parts of the brain, they just go here and back. Controls kind of what your eyes look at. You have a lot of reflexes associated with your eyes. Whenever you hear a sound, your eyes move toward the sound. It's a reflex, kind of like the leg kicking. Isn't that interesting? Um, this part here is called the diencephalon. It's got an area called the thalamus that sends the proper signal to the proper part of the brain, the cerebrum, the whole thing's the brain. And it also has the hypothalamus, which sits right here, and the hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland, which lays down here. It controls most, many of the body's hormones. And the hypothalamus, which sits right here, also controls hunger and thirst sleeping and um, 
all sorts of things. Where's the thyroid? The thyroid gland is around the neck. The pituitary controls the thyroid gland. And the thyroid gland controls your metabolism. How fast your metabolism run. So the brain stem and diencephalon, that controls everything you don't have to think about. It's often called the reptilian brain because in reptiles it looks about the same as it does in us. Reptiles have all those unconscious things that you have. They have fear and they have a sex drive and they control their body temperature and they control the movement of food and the heart rate and all that. They do all that same as us. <coughs> now this back thing here, the cerebellum, that controls muscle coordination. That's big in most animals. And because uh, you, you have a lot of muscles that you have to control and coordinate. If you watch me swing a golf club, I mean, it is so coordinated and smooth, and the motion is just beautiful. It's like watching a symphony. Listening to a symphony, maybe? I don't know. Anyway. Uh, your cerebellum can, can sends out hundreds of signals, even thousands of signals a second, telling the right muscle to contract at just the right time to produce that perfect golf swing. And it took years of practice. If you watch pro basketball players, Michael Jordan or, or LeBron or whoever, shoot, it's all just perfectly smooth and it looks like they're not even trying. People who don't know much about basketball say, the pros, they aren't even trying out there. No, they don't even play hard. It's not that. It's that their movements are so perfect and smooth that it looks like they're not doing much. If you look at a good golf swing, a pro golfer, it doesn't look like he's even trying very hard, some of them. And it's because everything's so perfectly coordinated. When you walk, man, you've practiced walking for whatever, how old are y'all? 16, 17 years, 18 years, you've practiced walking, you're pretty good at it. A little baby, watch them walk, they're... They're all over the place. They aren't very good at it. The cerebellum has to learn the coordination. And the better you do it, and that baby first gets up and first takes that step, and then they probably fall, their, their brain learns, oh, I fired this one, and then this one, and then this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and that made me take a step. I'll do that again. And then they get another step, and that one's a little bit better. And they toy with it a little bit, and, and that's what they're doing. That's what babies are doing. They're learning. So the cerebellum coordinates all muscle movements, and it's pretty big. In organisms that have more muscles, the cerebellum is even bigger. You know, like a big elephant or something like that would have a big cerebellum. There's a look at the brain. You'll see one just like this on Thursday. No, not just like this. We aren't dissecting human brains. I couldn't get the human brains. Sorry. My contact, I couldn't get a hold of. I agree. So we're going to uh, dissect sheep brains. And you'll see sheep brains look a little different. They're not as convoluted. And guess what? The spinal cord doesn't come in from right underneath. It comes in from the back. Because they walk on all fours, you see. Humans walk up right so the spinal comes in underneath. Here is that map I was telling you about of the cerebrum. And they've done this by putting electrodes on different parts of the brain and seeing what those parts of the brain do. Have you heard about this electrode stimulation? Have you seen this? Maybe not. We can go back to the brain surgery to demonstrate the electrical nature of the nervous system. In addition to recording the brain's electrical activity, the surgeon will use another kind of electrode to introduce a small electric current into the patient's brain. In essence, he creates a nerve impulse that travels through her nervous system. The patient must be conscious to report the results of the doctor's probing. She feels little or no pain, for the brain has no pain receptors of its own. When you see her mouth open, it's because the doctor has stimulated an area of her brain that controls the mouth. She isn't moving it on her own. 
The patient may feel a tingling sensation somewhere else on her body instead. The impulse could even cause the patient to see things that aren't there or hear music. The effect depends on the site of the stimulation. They have to have the patient awake because remember, this is all conscious stuff. Everything in the cerebrum is conscious, so if you're awake, you're aware of it, and they activate a part. How long ago was that video called? That, that was old. But they still do that because the doctor, if they're going to remove a tumor or something, they have to know where to cut. And so they don't want to cut through a part that's really important, so they stimulate it. If the patient says they're not feeling anything, or they're not sensing anything, that's, that's where they cut. So anyway, here's, so here's what we know. We know that this red area here, remember, this is, well, it's divided into lobes. You might not know this. The orange part, that's the frontal lobe. This green part's the parietal lobe. The back part's the occipital lobe. And this part that looks like a thumb of a boxing glove is the temporal lobe. It's like a boxing glove to me. No, I'm saying it looks like there's an alligator in it looking that way. You're like seeing things in the clouds. <laughs> now this red part is involved in muscle control. But if you touch it anywhere here with the electrode, your muscles move. Remember the commercial where he was touching and it's like an Expedia commercial and the doctor's yeah. messing with it and the guy's doing things. It's a funny commercial. So that's all voluntary muscle control. That's called the motor cortex right there. Some people have a stroke, which is a broken blood vessel in the brain, and they, they can't move their muscles after that. You may have seen a person walking around and maybe their face is like this on one side. They can't move any of their muscles on one side of their body. That's probably a stroke. That's probably a blood vessel broken somewhere in here. On the opposite side of the brain, because the left side, remember, controls the right half of the body. So if a guy came into the doctor like this, and they say, what's wrong? He goes, I want to move my right side. And then he goes, he's immediate, that doctor's immediately thinking, probably had a stroke. He's probably in the motor cortex on the left side of the brain. Without even having to do anything with him. Yeah? Can't you, like, sometimes walk away from a stroke? Sure, yeah, if it's a minor stroke. Yeah, some people have a minor stroke, which is just a little loss of blood in the brain. It doesn't do anything. But it depends on the severity of the stroke. This part right here is the sensory cortex. Everything that you sense is sensed right here. So if you had a stroke there, you wouldn't be able to feel parts of your body. You could move them, but you couldn't feel them. And sometimes people have a stroke that's a wide area and they can't move them or feel them. Would that be the same thing as being paralyzed? Or is it yeah, it could, yeah, it could be paralyzed. Uh huh. Could lead to paralysis. How about they couldn't be able to talk? Like sometimes like mumble. Well, the motor cortex here also controls the muscles of the vocal cord and such. So yeah, that'll it could could possibly make you not able to talk. Like I in the movie. Um, how come like he makes sounds, but like it's not words? I mean, I think he's in the coma. Well, he doesn't have a pro he doesn't have a problem up here. He has a problem down here in the brainstem. Uh -oh. So he's not he he can't arise to consciousness. So like the signals aren't getting through. The signals might come from here, but they aren't getting through. Is he dreaming at all? Or I don't, uh, I don't think so. Yeah. Now this area here, the frontal lobe, is, look at all these things. Concentration, planning, problem solving. There's a speech area here called Broca's area, and it's usually only in the left hemisphere. But if that's damaged, it's a motor speech area. So if that's damaged, you can't talk. Or you have problems talking.
This is uh, where the stake went through Phineas Gage's head. Did we learn about that? Psychology. A guy named Phineas Gage, he was a railroad worker, and uh, there was an explosion, and it shot an iron rod through his frontal lobe. And it didn't kill him, which is amazing, but it changed his personality. He was a mild-mannered, soft-spoken, nicest guy in the world, and he turned to a foul, cursing, mean guy. Everything else about him was the same. Um, the parietal lobe, understanding speech, using words. Here's a special area called Wernicke's area. That's a German name, so it's pronounced Wernicke's area. The sensory speech area. If that's damaged, you can't understand speech. You can say speech fine, but you can't understand the speech. And, mo and usually Wernicke's area and Broca's area are only in the left hemisphere of the brain. But in some people, it's in the right. And you say, well, are those people that it's in the right, are they left-handed? No, it doesn't work out like that. So we don't really understand why, how the brain and why the brain is wired exactly how it is, but it's interesting stuff. So. The occipital lobe in the back is mostly concerned with vision, visual area, Combining visual images, visual recognition of objects. There is some vision in the frontal lobe, lobe the frontal eye field, that has to do with um, eye movements and such. But most of vision is in the back. And then the thumb of the boxing glove here is the temporal lobe. And that usually, mostly has to do with hearing. Interpretation of sensory experiences, memory of visual and auditory patterns, auditory meaning hearing. And there's this auditory area right here in the temporal lobe. A lot of hearing has to do with the temporal lobe, but other stuff too. And if you're wondering where memories are stored, memories are stored everywhere in the cerebrum, not in one particular place. Dreams, dreams can come from all over the place as well, just like memories do. And we really don't know what dreams are. And remember, we already studied that. If the sensory speech area is damaged, you can't understand what someone's saying to you. That's correct. So how, how can you actually, can you not? Like, you can speak. I can say, Queen Kathleen, what's going on? And I would hear... Well, why are you? <laughs> when you said something. You would hear the words, but you wouldn't understand them. Can you read them? So you couldn't. Uh, yeah, I think you could read them. So is it possible for people to be like deaf, but they can still hear you? <laughs> it would be called deaf, because deaf means can't hear. I think I <laughs> but they could hear and not understand. People with damage in Wernicke's area hear right away when somebody's talking. That's all they hear. They can't make sense of it. Hey, look, you have shrimp in your brain. What? Giant shrimp. I'm allergic to shrimp. Those are actually called ventricles. In your brain, you have huge containers of cerebrospinal fluid called ventricles, and they're shaped kind of like a shrimp. Here they are looking head on, and here's how it looks from the side. These blue areas are the ventricles. And they have the cells, the ependymal cells, that create cerebrospinal fluid and store it and circulate it. Kind of interesting. Most people don't know about the ventricles of the brain. Some of the fluid runs down the very center of 
the spinal cord, but most of the fluid goes around the brain and spinal cord. These blue areas where the arrows are. It's a circulating fluid. The book talks about that a bit. So the brain, the section on the brain is, you can study the brain for eight years. Brain surgeons do. And I mean, there is, it is so much to it. I don't, I mean, every, these, these magazines that I have up here, you know, every month or two, there's an article on part of the brain and how it works. It is a huge uh, method of study, a huge subject of study. I mean, there's, it is very complicated. Lots of cells, how they interact, how they store information. We don't know it all. They're, they're figuring it out slowly, but this will probably be another 100 years or so before they got it figured out completely. Those will be discoveries you'll be reading about your whole life, if you are into it. And a brain surgeon is one of the top jobs. I mean, if, you're, if somebody's going to be cutting into your brain, don't you, don't you want them to be knowledgeable? That's why they make the big bucks. So if you want to be a, if you want to go for one of the toughest jobs, you do it. You become a brain surgeon. Okay, we're going to uh, continue with this video, and then I think we should have some time for some IDs at the end.